Welcome back. Here we are again. It's time for lesson three, the representation of complex things. Okay. First of all, let's talk about some learning goals. The first is to understand how the Einstein relation appears in quantum mechanics. The second, understand how the de Broglie relationship actually sort of comes from the Einstein relation in special relativity. We're going to develop a geometrical interpretation of the amplitude e to the i k x e to the minus i omega t. We've already talked about e to the minus i omega t. We haven't yet really addressed the e to the i k x, so we're going to talk about that today. And finally, we'll begin the development of a vPython program that's designed to illustrate a traveling wave in three dimensions. Now, uh, that piece is actually going to happen in class. I'm not going to say much about that in the podcast, but I wanted to let you know that it was coming so you could get your head screwed on and be ready for that. Let's begin with a little review. So you remember that we have this thing, uh, e to the i theta, from the Euler relation. You know that that can be thought of as a, a kind of an arrow in the complex plane that makes an angle theta with the real axis. We also know that uh, in quantum mechanics, these phasers change in time, and they change in time that depend in a way that depends on the energy. So we'd replace the theta with an omega t, where omega is given by the Einstein relation. And you may remember that we think of that as an arrow that sort of spins around with a frequency omega, uh, something like this. But today we're going to explode that a little bit and move it into a three-dimensional representation. It looks like an arrow spinning around like so. Um, I happen to look at it from a direction where it spins the other way. If you looked at it from the other side, it would spin the same way the original picture did. But in any case, um, the, uh, the way the Schrodinger equation is conventionally written, usually the time part comes in with a minus sign, so the, air, the phasers spin in the opposite direction, e to the minus i omega t. Now, for the purposes of today's lecture, uh, it's going to be helpful to have associated with phase not only a direction in this three-dimensional picture, but also a color. So I went ahead and developed a modified version of the program that changes the color of the vector as it goes around, the, the phaser as it goes around, so you could also determine the phase by looking at the color. So let's think about the simplest possible situation we can imagine, and that probably is a single particle at rest. Now if it's at rest, what do we know about its momentum? Well, we know its momentum is zero. But if we know its momentum is zero, that means we know its momentum exactly. But if you think about the uh, what you call uncertainty principle, if you know the momentum exactly, that means the uncertainty in the position must be infinite. So we don't know its position at all x is completely unknown. That means that the amplitude or the probability density is constant, which means the magnitude of the quantum mechanical amplitude must be constant. So let's see, how can we imagine that happening? Um, the only way that can be, I, I, when I say constant, I mean constant in space. It can vary in time because the thing can have energy, but it can't depend on position. The probability density as a function of position has to be constant because we have no idea where the thing is. That means it's equally likely to be anywhere. Okay, what about its energy? Well, it, if it's at rest, its energy is its rest energy, which is just mc squared. So that tells us everything we need to know to deduce the wave function directly. We know it has to vary in time according to its energy, and we know it can't vary in space because we don't have any idea what its position is. We do know what its energy is because we know it's just the rest energy. So that tells us omega. Omega must be mc squared over h bar. Okay, how do we view this in three dimensions? You can imagine we've got a bunch of phasers. Each phaser represents the amplitude for the particle to be at any different location. And the magnitude of those phasers has to all be the same because the thing can't have any uh, dependence on position. And they all have to have the same phase because, again, the wave function can't depend on position. Um, so there we have it. What if we add color? If we add color, um, 
the phasers just change their color as they go around. And that's all there is to it. Okay? So what do these phasers look like in space-time? So in a space-time diagram, I use one direction to represent space. I use a different direction to represent time. Um, what I'm going to do is to use, since we don't have to worry about the amplitude of the wave function, all we have to worry about is its phase, I'm going to use uh, color to represent phase. So let's look at a space-time diagram. X is left and right, T is up and down. Let's imagine some events that might occur in that space-time diagram. Just to remind you about how space-time works, you might think about which of those two events occurs at the same place. If you say A and C, you're right. What, what about which two of those events occur at the same time? If you say A and B, you're right. So now you have an idea of what this thing means. Let's overlay the phase of our wave function on top of that picture. And you can see that the phase does what you think it would do. It, it advances in time, but it doesn't depend on position. Okay, that's the idea. So now let's imagine uh, overlaying on top of that a space-time diagram for an observer moving relative to this original observer. Now, just to get our head screwed on here, for this new observer who's moving to the right relative to the stationary particle, um, which of those two events now occur at the same time? In the frame of the moving observer, it's going to be B and C that occur at the same time. Good. And which two of those events occur at the same place, according to this moving observer? The answer is none of them. They all occur at different locations, according to this moving observer. Good. Okay. So uh, what we want to do now is to imagine putting ourselves into the frame of reference of the moving observer. So we're going to stretch the space-time diagram to do that. And notice what happens. In the moving observer's frame of reference, the phase varies with position. No longer is the phase constant, the same everywhere. The phase now has a positional dependence on position. <laughs> How did I say that? It depends on position. If you look at different values of x prime, you get a different phase. Now what happens if I redraw the, the phasers now with that um, spatial dependence? It ends up looking like this. And how does it go? The thing goes to the left. So this particle which was at rest in one frame of reference appears to be a wave function propagating to the left in the frame of reference of the moving observer. And it has a wavelength. That wavelength is determined by the speed of the moving observer. And notice that um, the faster they go, the shorter the wavelength becomes. That is the correct idea for the de Broglie relation. The de Broglie relation is actually a consequence of relativity. I don't, I'm 92% sure de Broglie didn't actually derive it this way, but, uh, but it does work out. Okay, let's look at the math of the situation. If, uh, if we start with our original wave function that only depends on time, we do a Lorentz transformation into these primed coordinates and substitute the time back in, we get a, uh, a wave function that looks like this. Notice it depends on space and time now. If we do a little algebra, cancel some stuff out, replace things with other things, and so on, we get the final result that looks like this. Notice that the coefficient of time is the energy in the prime frame, but the coefficient of space looks like the wave number. That's the momentum divided by h bar in the prime frame. So that means that uh, we've uncovered the de Broglie relation. The, mom the wave number k, 2 pi over lambda, goes like the momentum divided by h-bar, and the energy in the prime frame goes like, uh, goes like the energy you'd expect. It's gamma times e. So um, if you think about that as a, as a wave function, notice that uh, you can factor out the space part and the time part. 
The space part is the e to the i k x. The time part is e to the minus i omega t. That's exactly what we were talking about before. We have phasers that depend on position by uh, going one way, phasers that depend on time by going the other way, and that corresponds to a particle propagating in space and time. So that's how that works. Let's, uh, let's look at a movie that describes this in a little more detail. Okay, so here is a traveling wave, much like the one we talked about before. And I'm going to turn on the time, and you can see that uh, it's very clear. This traveling wave appears to be moving to the right. You can see if I turn off the time that the dependence of the phase on position is uh, just e to the i k x. I can uh, I can look at it from different angles. You can see it's got a definite circularity or or corkscrew direction and. Uh, and that corresponds to e to the plus i k x minus omega t. So the uh, time direction, the, when the thing advances in time, if you look at any particular location, when it advances in time, the phase goes one way, but it's the opposite direction that the thing goes if you take any moment in time and advance in x. So if you look, notice if, you, if I turn this way, as you advance in x, notice that the, uh, the phase is going in the clockwise direction, but if you advance the time at any given position, the phase is going in the counterclockwise direction. So that's, it's the combination of those two effects, the behavior of the phase as a function of position and the behavior of the phase as a function of time that gives you the direction of propagation. Now, let me... Uh, let me take away that one and turn on this one. This is exactly the same idea, except now the positional dependence of the phase is reversed. So now this one's going like e to the minus i k x, which means it's propagating to the left. Now you may remember that um, k corresponds to momentum and omega corresponds to energy. So the plus ikx corresponds to a particle with positive momentum. The minus ikx corresponds to a particle with negative momentum. So this particle, the particle that has this amplitude, this variation in amplitude on, on space and time, corresponds to a particle moving to the left. Now what I want to do is to show what happens when I put both amplitudes together. Notice that um, no longer do you see any indication that something's moving to the left or right, but by putting both sets of amplitudes on the screen at the same time, the whole thing appears to stop. In fact, if I show you the superposition of those two amplitudes, you can see that it is in fact a standing wave. Interesting. Now, um, if I put those two amplitudes back, Actually, let's do one other thing here before we get to that. Here we are back to the right propagating wave. Let's calculate the probability density. How do I do that? It's just the length of the arrow squared. So, and I rescale it to make it uh, fit in the picture. This green cylinder represents the probability density. Notice probability is a real number. So how do you represent that on a complex plane? Well, you just make a solid cylinder that uh, that doesn't care about what the phase direction is, it just gives you a magnitude. So for a right propagating wave, the thing looks like this. For a left propagating wave, it looks like that. All that says is that the amplitude of the phasers is not a function of position. But what happens when I add the two right and left propagating waves together? Something interesting. You can see that at some places, the two phasers cancel, at other places they add, and what you end up with is a probability distribution that has humps in it. So this looks like the particle is likely to be found in those places where the phasers add. It's very unlikely to be found in those places where the phasers add destructively. They add everywhere, but they add constructively in some places, destructively in others. So. Uh, also notice, what's the momentum, what's the expectation value, I guess, or the average momentum in the case when you have both 
left and right propagating waves? Right, the answer is zero because you have a 50% probability of finding yourself propagating to the right, an equal probability of finding yourself propagating to the left, and so the average momentum, the average uh, overall momentum is zero. This is sometimes called a standing wave because the probability density does not depend on time. The total momentum, the average momentum, the expectation value of the momentum is zero. So that's the way that goes. All right, so that's all for this lesson. We'll see you in class, and we'll talk about writing VPython programs that, uh, that exploit some of this uh, lovely math. Talk to you soon.